Dobrý večer. But we can switch it in English uh, to English. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, on behalf of the Association of Political uh, Science Students Police and in uh, very nice cooperation with the uh, International Solidarity Movement uh, Czech Republic, I would like to welcome you at uh, this lecture uh, that will be given by uh, Mr. Miko Pellet. Uh, Mr. Pellet, uh, I welcome you to, to Prague and to the Char Charles University. Uh, and uh, Miko Pellet is our special guest for this, this evening. Uh, let me introduce Mr. Pellet quite shortly. Uh, Mr. Pellet is not only known as a son of the Israeli general Mati, uh, palette. This general uh, is uh, known from the uh, Six Day War in 1967. And uh, Mr. Mikopat is not only known as a former uh, karate coach and owner of the sixth degree black belt, but I don't know in which kind of karate, uh, Kekoshin, Kai Shotokai, or Gujuru. Uh, there are many, many kinds of karate. I, <laughs> Good job. Okay, thank you. <laughs> uh, but the uh, main uh, job of Mr. Pat is now uh, peace activism. Uh, Mr. Pat is uh, interested and engaged in the uh, uh, in an effort to improve uh, Israeli-Palestinian relations um, uh, on the on the civic level. And um, in spite of all difficulties, they are coming up uh, uh, from the Israeli officials or uh, from the uh, Jewish community in the United States. Um, but it's so because the activities of Mr. Pellet are connected with the harsh criticism of the Israeli officials and their current and steady uh, Palestine policy. And uh, also, Mr. Pat criticizes, uh, often criticizes the overwhelming historical narrative in Israel that's present also not only in Israel but also in in Europe. Uh, and uh, I I personally see a nice connection with uh, another uh, peace activist from this region is uh, Mr. Elias Shakur uh, is the. Um, former Archbishop from, ha from Haifa and uh, he wrote uh, also uh, 25 years ago book uh, We Belong to the Land so it's, it's also a personal, personal story but I think uh, the personal story uh, personal stories have uh, are, are very have, have a deep uh, touch and uh, I, can, I can conclude this introduction with the words uh, of Mr. Pellet. Uh, the truth lays uh, in the personal story, not in the national narrative. It's, it's often so. So, uh, dear audience, uh, and Mr. Pellet, the microphone is now yours. Uh, uh, thank you for your coming once again and uh, I hope uh, we will enjoy in this evening a very uh, exciting and interesting moment. Thank you. Thank you. I can take us back here. Right? Okay. Can you hear me if I talk like this? Yes. Okay, thank you. Well, thank you for the introduction and thank you all for being here. Uh, it's an honor to be here in Prague. Um, <clears throat> it's a real pleasure actually to be here in Prague. I've uh, heard about Prague from everybody I know. I'm the last, of all my family and friends, I'm the last person to visit Prague. And um, it's very rare that you vid visit a city that everybody admires and that it actually exceeds your expectations. And I have to say, I've been here for a few days and this is a beautiful place. It's a really wonderful city and very hospitable. So I'm really having a good time here. So thank you all. Uh, thank you also the representative from the Palestinian Embassy for coming tonight. It's an honor to have you. Um, let me ask first of all, how many people here are actually from Israel or Palestine? Okay. Thank you. 
How many people here have been there to visit? Who's been there to visit? Oh, many people, okay. Is there anybody who can't find it on a map? No, no such person? You never know, it's a very small place. If you look on a map, it's actually very hard to find. Usually the name of the country is too big for the country. Whether you call it Israel or Palestine, it's usually on the Mediterranean somewhere. Um, I, gave this, I gave a talk in front of uh, a, a school, uh, high school students a while ago. And in preparation for my visit, in preparation for my talk, they, of course, studied, about the, studied the issue well, and they decided to take a poll among themselves. And they asked themselves, how many of them believed there would be peace in their lifetime? Now, these students were about 14 years old, um, which is a very interesting thing. Uh, this was in the, in the United States. And out of, those, uh, out of that class of 14-year-olds, the results of the poll were that 80% of these 14-year-old kids, 80% thought there will not be peace in their lifetime. Peace in, you know, Palestine, Israel, which is, of course, bad news. Um, so I like to ask audiences before I talk, how many people here think they'll see peace in their lifetime? Can I, show, can I see a show of hands? Raise your hand if you think there will be peace in your lifetime. Oh, well, we have many optimists, good. <laughs> how many people think there will not be peace in their lifetime? Okay, thank you. And everybody else is just not sure. What's going on yet? Waiting to see. Well, what I told those kids, uh, those school children, and not children, but those school uh, students, and what I tell audiences where I speak, if I did not, if I was not absolutely confident that peace, and we'll talk about what this means in a second, but uh, was not only possible, but inevitable in my lifetime, in fact, in all of our lifetime, I wouldn't be here speaking. I don't see any point in talking about something that's hopeless. Might as well stay home. There's no point in talking about something if it's hopeless. Um, now, we determine whether or not we have hope, partly based on our personality. Some people are optimistic, some people are pessimistic. We can't change that. But also based on the information that we have at our disposal. And I think much of the information that people have at their disposal is wrong. Um, and many people, as a result of that, come out thinking that it's hopeless, or they come out supporting the wrong side. This is typical in the United States, it's typical in Europe. Well-meaning people come out, stu study the issue, and they come out supporting the side of Israel, which in my view is the wrong side. And I'll make it absolutely clear, my presentation is absolutely not balanced. There's not going to be any balance in my presentation. I don't believe this is a balanced issue. Uh, and I will say clearly, I think supporting the Israeli side is absolutely either misinterpretation of the facts or just plain wrong. And I'll tell you why in just a little bit. Um, now, here are some of the things that are confusing. First of all, when people say it's a complicated issue. And when people say it's a complicated issue, uh, most of us think, okay, it's complicated, we'll leave it alone. And that's exactly why they say it's a complicated issue, because they want people to leave it alone. If we look at the, the last 50 years around the world, we see that more complicated issues have been resolved peacefully, much more complicated than this particular, the, the, the question of Palestine. Um, another thing that is often said is, well, those people over there have been killing each other forever. They have been killing each other for thousands of years in Palestine, you know, which is, of course, not true. But again, it's one of these code words to say, ah, pff, leave it alone. It's hopeless. And like I said, I don't believe it's hopeless at all. Um, I think here in Europe, particularly in Central Europe, there's another added issue here, which is the connection between, or the so-called connection, between the state of Israel, which again is a so-called Jewish state, and... Um, Nazi Germany and the Holocaust and so forth, and World War II. Um, and it's interesting that people often say that the lesson of the Holocaust is that there's a need for a Jewish state. I would think that the lesson of the Holocaust is that we need to ensure 
the human rights and the civil rights of everybody. Not take one group at the expense of somebody else and impose a racist colonialist regime in an Arab country. But there you have it. This is, this, is part of the, this is part of what people say. They talk about the Holocaust and then they talk about Israel somehow as though it's a result of the Holocaust and as though the Holocaust excuses what Israel does. And often people will say, well, how can the Jews who suffered so much now do this in Palestine? It's not the same Jews. These happen to be Jews and these happen to be Jews. But the fact is that the vast majority of Holocaust survivors did not go to Palestine, did not go to Israel. Only maybe 10% out of about 2 million refugees ended up immigrating to Israel. It's not the same Jews. So if the very Jews who suffered the most decided they did not want a Jewish state, what is all this argument about the need for a Jewish state? If anybody needed that state, it would have been them. But the Zionist narrative is built on myth upon myth upon myth. It begins with connecting today's Jews with the ancient Hebrews, which is kind of really basically a myth. And then it connects the Jewish people to the Old Testament as though the Old Testament is a history book, which is not. And then we've got a nation now, we've got a history book, and of course the country has to be the land of Israel, which is Palestine. So myth upon myth upon myth. And the problem is that people take this as truth. Most people don't bother to study deeper than what they hear, and it's actually a very interesting truth. It's a very interesting story. So why not accept it? And then they talk about the right of Jewish people to return to their ancient homeland. And this is, of course, today part of the discussion, part of the consensus. Jewish people have a right to go back to their ancient homeland. Well, first of all, we don't really know that these Jewish people came from there. I don't know any Jewish people who trace their roots back to the ancient Hebrews. But even if it was true, it's very interesting because when we talk about the right of return of the Palestinians, suddenly nobody wants to talk about that. Suddenly a red line is drawn. So people who say that they, or claim that they are the descendants of an ancient tribe that lived on that land some 3,000 years ago are telling people who still remember the day they had to leave, who still have the deeds to their land, and still often have the keys to their homes, that they have to forget, because we need to put the past behind us. And this is perfectly acceptable. This is how the discussion about Palestine takes place in the world. It became perfectly acceptable to accept this absurd double standard that people who say they have a right to return because maybe they're connected to an ancient tribe that lived there are telling people who are living in refugee camps that they do not have the right to return. And again, this is obviously very confusing. We can see why this is such a confusing issue. Um, over the last few weeks, every time I've had an interview or did a Q&A session, I was asked about Kerry and his initiative, John Kerry and the Peace Initiative. And this whole peace initiative, this whole industry of the peace talks is a very interesting phenomenon. I think the first question we need to ask ourselves, Palestine and Israel, is it one country or two? Because quite often people think there's an Israel and there's a Palestine, and they're at war, and we need to help them make peace. But that's not the reality. Israel and Palestine is the same place. It's one country. It's not at war. You don't have two armies fighting each other. In fact, there's never been a Palestinian army. I don't think there's ever been a Palestinian tank or an F-16. So it's not two nations at war that need help bringing about peace. It's an, a regime of oppression and colonization that needs to be transformed into a democracy with equal rights. So peace talks have got nothing to do with this. 
which is why they're not leading to anything. Because the peace talks are trying to solve a problem that doesn't exist. It's actually a complete diversion. People have a sense that in Europe and the Europeans and the Americans are thinking, well, we're doing something, we have peace talks. We don't need peace talks. We need to change the, 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 the oppressive racist regimes that exist in Palestine today just the way apartheid had to be removed from South Africa. And it's not nice to say, and it's not popular, but the reality is that today Zionism is the issue, just like apartheid was the issue in the 80s. So peace talks have got nothing to do with it. A struggle to end the apartheid in Palestine should be the issue. But again, it's kind of like a, a diversion, a smokescreen. We're doing something. There's peace talks. And these people just can't get along. Now, it's very interesting when you try to talk about the beginning of the conflict. Where exactly it began, it may be hard to, to, find, to, to exactly say. But we can certainly say that the 29th of November, 1947, is a good starting point. On that day, the United Nations decided to partition Palestine. Can we take this off? I don't think we need this microphone. Just take it off, yeah. Decided to partition Palestine. And this is one of these examples of the West taking charge and trying to take a complex issue and make it simple. So the Arabs wanted the country a little bit, and the Jews wanted the country a little bit, so we give the Jews a little bit, and we give the Arabs a little bit, and everybody should be happy. It really makes sense. And of course, on a superficial level, well, maybe it makes sense. Until we start looking at the complexity the complexities of the issue. In 1947, there were only about half a million Jews living in Palestine. This was a generation of my grandparents who immigrated, and then my parents who were born there. The Palestinian population was close to a million and a half. Yet when the United Nations decided to partition the land, if you can look at the map, they gave the larger portion, the kind of the bluish, greenish portion, to the Jewish community and the smaller portion to the native Palestinian community. Now, first of all, who in the world is the United Nations to give out and slice out countries? But who thought this was going to work? In fact, all the way, even today, people say, you know, it's the Palestinians' fault. This whole conflict is the Palestinians' fault because they refused the partition plan. Would anybody in their shoes not refuse it? Not that they were even asked. It's not like the Palestinians were asked and they said no. But, I mean, who would accept such an absurd idea that a foreign power would take your country, take the larger portion, and give it to a small community of immigrants who really almost just came off the boat. And from this moment, from that particular moment on, we have, in many ways, the beginning of the conflict because now we have two histories that are diametrically opposed. The difference in the history that the Zionists have and the history that the Palestinians have from that moment on of the partition plan, it doesn't differ in you know, nuance or detail. These are two completely opposite stories. There is no balance. There is no way to bridge it. These are two completely opposite stories. And people in the West often like to find some kind of a way to make, you know, bring the two closer together. We can't. And of course, when the two histories are completely different, then only one of them can be true. So the story that I grew up with as an Israeli, and the story that people uh, grew up with in the West, basically, is that the Jewish community accepted the partition plan, even though we, the Jews, deserve the entire country because it's ours. It's our country. But we accepted the partition plan. The Arabs did not. And then the Arabs began a massive attack against the small Jewish population, the small Jewish community, because they wanted to kill the Jews. Just like the Nazis did before that, and the Romans did before that, and the Egyptians did before that. And we have a whole long history that we recite. But basically, one more, one more in a long line of people who wanted to kill Jews. And thankfully, the Jewish community in Palestine was quick, on their feet, they were more advanced, they were smart, and they were able to defeat the Arab armies. And at the end of this war, which we, the Israelis, call the War of Independence, 
the state of Israel was established, the Jewish state was established once again in the land of Israel after 2,000 years in exile. This is almost biblical. It's just so exciting. It's, you, can't imagine, can you, you can't possibly make up a story that's that wonderful. I mean, it's unreal. It's almost biblical. Once again, the descendants of King David who defeated Goliath and the Maccabees who defeated great empires and so on and so on, once again, the few defeated the many and, and, you know, they, and prevailed and the Jewish state was established. And so it's such a wonderful story that nobody wants to look into it. Few people want to refute it. And why would you want to? It's a wonderful story, especially as an Israeli. And as Israelis, we draw so much of who we are from that story, which is why Israelis quite often refuse to discuss or get very defensive when you try to take apart this story. But the fact remains that when we look at the details once again, we see that though both communities, the Jewish community in Palestine and the Palestinian community in Palestine, both were expecting to become states and were both beginning to develop institutions of state, there was one thing that the Zionist community in Palestine, the Jewish community in Palestine, developed that the Palestinians never did. A fighting force, a militia, an armed militia. By 1947, the Zionist militia in Palestine numbered close to 40,000 well-trained armed men and very motivated. My father was an officer in this militia. There was no equivalent on the Palestinian side. So if there was no equivalent on the Palestinian side, who are these Arabs that attacked? And what did they attack with? We know that other Arab countries intervened later on. Six, seven months later, Arab ar armies intervened in Palestine. But in 1947, who were these Arabs that attacked? And once again, we look further, we look deeper, and we realize actually they didn't. As soon as the United Nations passed the resolution to partition Palestine, the Zionist militias began a massive campaign, military campaign, which can only be characterized as terrorism and ethnic cleansing, which lasted for a whole year. An armed militia committed an act of terrorism that lasted for 12 months, at the end of which hundreds of cities and towns were wiped off, completely off the face of the earth close to a million or somewhere between 800,000 and a million Palestinians were forced into exile. And almost 80% of Palestine was captured and, and, and conquered and occupied by the Zionist forces. And the state of Israel was established. So it's not so romantic right now anymore. And it's not so heroic perhaps, but at least the pieces fit the puzzle. We can now understand how it happened. There was no miracle here. There was no miracle at all. Now, one of the claims that is often made is that, well, maybe a few towns were destroyed, maybe a few Palestinians were forced to leave, but there was really nothing there. The Palestinians were Bedouins, they were poor farmers, you know, all the progress came from the Jews, from the Zionists, all the advancement came from the Zionists. Well, this is a picture of the city of Jaffa before 1948. It was a city, it was a major, important Arab city, numbering of almost 120,000 people, with a rich business life, a rich political life, movie theaters, concert halls, several newspapers were published there in, in Jaffa. It was a rich and thriving and important Arab city on the coast of the Mediterranean. And in a matter of two weeks in 1948, this city of close to 120,000 was reduced to less than 4,000. Concentrated in one neighborhood with barbed wires and Israeli soldiers guarding them. And, in a picture that's almost exactly from the same angle, we now have Tel Aviv, the modern Israeli city. Jaffa was an important Arab city with a, a Jewish community, a small Jewish community. Tel Aviv is, of course, a modern Israeli city with a small, neglected, and oppressed Palestinian minority. So much so, or, or part of the neglect and part of the oppression of the Palestinians who are Israeli citizens, you know, because Yafo is it's part of Tel Aviv, the police don't even go in to solve crime. The only form of police that goes into Yafa are the Israeli border police, which go in to harass Palestinians. So you have murder cases unsolved, uninvestigated. So, of course, crime thrives and so on, so it makes it impossible for people to live. 
Now this is important not only to understand what happened in 1948, it's also important in the context of realizing that Palestine cannot be reduced to the West Bank and Gaza. The problems of Palestine exist throughout the entire country. You cannot reduce Palestine into the West Bank and Gaza. And that's of course what people talk about when they talk about this quite absurd idea of a two-state solution. Now, the Palestinians of course call the War of 1948 the Nakba, the catastrophe. We, the Israelis, call it the War of Independence. And I remember when I heard the word Nakba for the first time, I was insulted. How can anybody call something so important and so wonderful as the creation of the Jewish state a catastrophe? It's such an important and wonderful thing. But, of course, over the years, I learned why it was called a Nakba. But I think what people don't realize today is that the catastrophe didn't happen in 1948. It began in 1948, 1947, actually. And it's a process that still goes on today, perhaps even worse than it was uh, in 1947-48. We have about over 4 million refugees living in a refugee camp. This is a picture I, just, I took about a year ago in a refugee camp. I mean, the picture says it all. You can see there's no running water, no electricity, no sewage, no access to health care, no access to clean water. And this is not in sub-Saharan Africa or in the mountains of Afghanistan. This is maybe an hour drive maybe even less, from major modern Israeli cities. You're never going to find Israeli kids looking like this. You're not going to find Israeli towns looking like this. And the question is, why are Palestinian children, why do they deserve to live like this, where, like I said, half an hour or an hour's drive from that are modern Israeli cities, quite often the very places from which their grandparents were forced to leave. This is such a catastrophe, and it, what makes it worse is that we allow it to continue. This is happening under our watch. This is happening now every single day. Palestinians having to live like this only because the world chooses to support Israel. And nobody dares talk about this because this makes Israel look bad. And so I would encourage you to remind people that this is unjustifiable and inexcusable. And if this is the lesson of the Holocaust, then everybody's lost their mind completely. If there is a lesson of the Holocaust, the Holocaust is that this must never be allowed to happen. And it makes no difference if the children are Jewish or not Jewish or, or Christian or Muslim or whatever. This has to be the lesson. And sadly, I think it's a lesson that hasn't been learned. Now, the way my book works, the way the book was written, the way it's structured is it goes between the story of my family, the personal narrative of my family, which was very much involved with the creation of the State of Israel, and the actual relations between the two people, Israelis and Palestinians. And there's a story that my mother told me many, many times. Now, my mother was born and raised in Jerusalem. This is her when she was young. She still lives there. She's 87 years old. And in 1948, she was already a young mother. And she was living with her, my older siblings in a small apartment with her parents. And in 1948, and when I say Jerusalem, I don't mean the old city. I mean the, the neighborhoods, you know, west of the old city, the modern, the new neighborhoods in what later became the Israeli side of Jerusalem. When the Zionist forces, they took those Palestinian neighborhoods that existed there, very well-to-do neighborhoods. They're still there, by the way. Only the people are gone. And the houses in these Palestinian neighborhoods were made available to Israeli families. And my mother was offered one of these homes. And the way she tells a story, every single time since I was a child, and even when we talk about this today, is the exact same way. And the way she begins the story is, how could I possibly take the home of another mother? How could I possibly move into the home of another family that now has to live in exile? And then she would go on to describe the looting big trucks, military trucks, because these are well to do homes, and if you've been to Jerusalem, you may have seen them. Now, of course, most of them are boutiques and restaurants, but the host is still there. So the, the furniture was stolen, and the rugs were stolen, and you may have seen there's an excellent documentary about the books that were stolen, rare, doc, rare manuscripts and books that were stolen. The Zionist forces were so organized that they even had a unit of librarians to go house by house and look for rare books that now sit in the, uh, in the library in the Hebrew University. So she talks about this with great shame. How could Israelis, could have, how could we have possibly done this as a people? 
And of course, it's an interest, it's, a, it's a very good story, and we all would hope that we would have acted the same way. The problem for me with this story is that it troubled me for many, many years. And it wasn't until I was actually working on the book that I understood why this was troubling. Her story contradicts the national narrative. Her personal story contradicts the national Zionist narrative. And I couldn't figure this out, and I couldn't uh, bridge this, uh, these two stories, like I said, until I was actually working on the book. You see, the Zionist narrative is morally perfect, and she was presenting a moral dilemma. The land belongs to us. We deserve it. It's the land of Israel, and we are Jews. We agreed to the partition. We were attacked. Thankfully, we were victorious. And then we asked the Arabs to stay, and they left. At the end of 1948, we asked them to stay, and they left. So if we asked them to stay, and they left, that means there's an empty home that somebody doesn't want, and there's a family that needs a home. Where's the moral dilemma? There's no moral dilemma in this story. In fact, the Zionist story is so perfect that even when Israelis do learn about atrocities, it still works out somehow and fits, fits the, this perfectly moral story. Israelis learn about the massacre of Dir Yassin. Dir Yassin was a small village on the outskirts of Jerusalem. When the Zionist forces took the village, the village surrendered, and they were massacred anyway. They committed a terrible massacre there. And Israeli students learn about this in their school books, in school. And it was a terrible thing, of course. Women and children were killed and so on. At the same time, the story ends with Chaim Weizmann, who was an important Zionist leader, saying that although the massacre was a terrible thing, as a result of the massacre, thousands of Arabs fled, which allowed us to establish a Jewish majority in the land of Israel. In other words, there was a good outcome. And today it's the same thing. Israel bombs Hamas knowing full well they will kill and injure innocent civilians. But we have to protect ourselves against Hamas because Hamas are terrorists. And before this it was somebody else. It doesn't matter. There's always somebody there who's a terrorist, who fits the terrorist uh, model. There's always a perfectly moral reason. The Zionist narrative is always perfectly moral. And again, here she was poking holes at this perfectly moral story. Now, I think most of you know, probably between 1967 and 1948 and 1967, this was the map. Palestine was almost completely occupied by Israel, with the exception of the West Bank and Gaza. In 1968, come, uh, 67 comes around, and once again we hear that Israel is under an existential threat. That Arab armies are amassing their forces in order to destroy the small Jewish state, once again. And once again, the descendants of King David and the descendants of the Maccabees defeat the Arab armies, this time in six days. It's really almost biblical. Six days. And the rest of the land of Israel is taken, along with the Sinai Peninsula, and three Arab armies are destroyed. Huge victory. What's interesting about this story is, uh, as I was working on the book, I went into the Israeli army archives to learn about my father's career. This is him. And one of the most interesting things that I was able to see are the minutes of the meetings of the Israeli generals in the weeks and days before the 1967 war. Well, I'm going to go back to this map. And what's interesting is that not only, I mean, many people have seen these documents, many people have written about, the, about, the, about these times, they were very interesting times, you know, the Israeli cabinet was hesitant, the Israeli generals wanted war, there was this tug of war between these two forces, and all of this has been recorded. But there's one thing I saw in those minutes that I'd never heard before, and that is something my father said, and, some, and then the other generals repeated, and that is that the Arab armies are not prepared for war, are not prepared for war. And therefore, there is now an opportunity to attack once again, destroy the Arab armies, and so on, and conquer more land. An opportunity. Not one word about a threat, other than to say, we need to present this as an existential threat so that we get public support and to pressure the government to allow us to begin the attack. The preemptive strike that they wanted so much. Of course, they got the preemptive, the, 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 finally the Israeli government allowed them to attack, the preemptive strike took place, 
And it's interesting. Every soldier that dies is somebody's son, and so, of course, we cry for all of them. Israel lost 700 soldiers in this war, in the War of 1967. The Arab army has lost about 15,000 soldiers. Like I say, every soldier that dies breaks your heart. It's somebody's son. The difference between 700 and 15,000 has to tell us something. And when the war was over, the generals congratulated themselves on what they called finishing the job. Finishing the job that was not finished in 1948. In other words, finishing the job of conquering the land of Israel. The catastrophe or the disaster of 1967, in fact, allowed Israel to create a single state over all of Palestine with exclusive rights for Jewish people. And of course, immediately after the West Bank was taken, thousands and thousands, in fact, hundreds of thousands of Palestinians were forced into exile. Cities and towns and villages were destroyed. And massive building began for Israeli Jews only. Exactly what Israel did after 1948, they continued in the West Bank after 1967. They, was a, there was no break, there was no pause for thought. It was a continuous policy. It was part of the exact same thing. So today, when people imagine that there could be an Israeli government, a Zionist government, that will allow the Palestinians to establish a state in that country, it's a complete misreading, it's a complete misinterpretation, it's a complete misunderstanding of Zionism and of Israel. There is no scenario, there is no possibility that an Israeli government will ever allow the Palestinians to establish a Palestinian state in what we consider as Israelis the land of Israel which is the entire country. Palestine was wiped, was crossed off the map, Israel took its place, and that's it. How we deal with the Palestinians? Well, well, we figure this out day by day. Now, an interesting thing that my father did, as soon as the war was over, at the very first, at the very first meeting of the Israeli High Command, as everybody was, of course, very pleased and congratulating themselves, he stood up and he said, we now have an opportunity to solve the Palestinian problem in a peaceful way. We can allow the Palestinians to establish a state in the West Bank and Gaza. We will then be able to make peace with them, and this will be our bridge to the rest of the Arab world. This will help us ensure the continuation of this Jewish democracy that we created as Israelis. He says, if we don't do this now, we will either become a binational state or this will be a continuing occupation and we're going to have to fight the resistance and this is what the army is going to be used, used for, to fight a resistance which, was inevi which is inevitable. And of course this will have, this will have terrible imp uh, impact on the moral fiber of the army and, and Israeli society and that's exactly what happened. That's exactly where we stand today. Now, of course, we hear quite a lot that Israel wants peace, but, you know, you can't talk to these people. You can't talk to the Arabs. You can't talk to the Palestinians. And I think it's important to take a look at what took place since 1967 to today in this regard. My father retired from the military a year after the war, and he continued to pursue this idea and to advocate, to be an advocate for this idea for the right of Palestinians to self-determination in the West Bank and Gaza, and also the rights of Palestinians who are Israeli citizens to equal rights. Two things that have not been accomplished until today, have not been achieved. And in the early, mid, in the mid-70s, he was joined by other Israelis, all of them, people who used to hold high position were, and were now, you know, doing other things, but this was their issue, they formed an organization, and immediately when they announced, immediately as they announced the formation of this organization that was dedicated to Israeli-Palestinian peace, they were contacted by major figures within the PLO, Yasser Arafat's top people, in order to begin a discussion on how to implement this idea. And they began meeting. The meetings were secret at first. They'd meet in Paris, they'd meet in Vienna, they'd meet in North Africa, and so on. And on the Palestinian side, these were officials of the Palestine Liberation Organization. In this picture, my father is with Essam Sartawi, who was a delegate to Paris and later on was assassinated. On the Israeli side, these were renegades. These were people who didn't really have any influence, but they were respectable people. 
And whenever they would come back from these meetings, my father would always go to inform the Prime Minister. Always. So the Israeli government was always informed by, by, about these meetings. They wanted nothing to do with it. They wanted nothing to do with it. In 1983, there was a well-publicized meeting with Yasser Arafat in Tunis. Uh, once again, confirming this idea that the Palestinian, top Palestinian leadership already in, in, in talking about and, and interested in creating in, in a peace agreement with Israel based on the two-state solution and so forth. Shortly after that, the Israeli Knesset passed a law that was initiated by Shimon Peres that made these meetings illegal. Specifically, these meetings illegal. Of course, my father and the others said, arrest us, we're not going to stop. And they didn't stop. The meetings continued. So not only did Israel not want to have anything to do with it, they wanted to prevent these meetings from taking place altogether. Then suddenly, 1993 came along. In September 1993, the Oslo Peace, peace Process. Now, this came, you know, the Soviet Union was falling, the Berlin Wall came down, apartheid in South Africa fell, and everybody, or many people, thought, this is the next thing. Palestine issued, now there will be peace. Oslo is going to be a new beginning for, uh, for a peaceful relationship between Israel and Palestinians. What, what, what should have been a sign was that the person on the Israeli side signing the agreement was Yitzhak Rabin, a war criminal that actually deserved to sit in the, at the ICC in The Hague rather than sign peace agreements, and a man who would never, ever allow the Palestinians to establish any kind of, any kind of state or, or anything in the West Bank. But there he was, and many people thought, you know, here it is. The only people who didn't think that were people who actually read the Oslo, the Oslo Accords, and they realized that the Oslo Accords had nothing to do with peace. They, had, they were an attempt to bring the Palestinians to surrender. Another thing that people didn't realize is by 1993, there was no longer a chance, there was no longer a possibility to establish a Palestinian state in the West Bank because there was no more West Bank. Israeli governments did everything they could after 1967 to eliminate the West Bank, to integrate it into Israel, and to make the conquest of the West Bank irreversible. And they succeeded. By 1993, there was no more West Bank. It was full of Israeli cities and towns and highways and so on. Oslo was an attempt to bring the Palestinians to surrender. They wouldn't surrender, of course, which is why it failed. Now, it was supposed to bring to a final solution in five years. 1993, that's 1998. In the year 2000, in the summer of the year 2000, as President Bill Clinton was leaving office, he wanted to help the two sides get together and close the deal. So he brought them all to Camp David. Some of you may remember, and they went to Camp David. And once again, many people thought, this is it. Now they're really just closing the deal. And the days went by, and the days went by, and another week goes by. Finally, they come out after about two weeks, I think. No deal. And Bill Clinton said, and I'll never forget this. He said, the Palestinians gave some, but the Israelis gave more. Clearly blaming the failure on the Palestinians. And, of course, the claim is Palestinians are not willing to make concessions. So Yasser Arafat, who was willing to give up 80% of Palestine, recognize the state that destroyed Palestine, forgo the rights of the refugees to ever return, and then make peace with this very state that destroyed Palestine. He was the one that was blamed for not making concessions. People don't see the absurdity of this. When you look at the map, the West Bank and Gaza are about 20% of, of Palestine. The refugees are still alive, we're hoping to come back one day. And he was willing to give all that up, but he's very consistent. The West Bank, with East Jerusalem, with no settlements, and with the Gaza Strip. Of course, no Israeli Prime Minister would ever allow that to happen. And because he wouldn't surrender like they wanted him to and at Camp David, he was vilified. Four years later, he died in Ramallah with Israeli tanks surrounding his office. Yasser Arafat was the most consistent voice for peace for three decades between the mid-1970s, when this idea came up, until the day he died, he was completely consistent. Peace based on two-state solution, the West Bank with no settlements, East Jerusalem, and the Gaza Strip. And no Israeli government was ever interested, which is why it never happened. 
I think no serious discussion on the issue of Palestine can take place without talking about the Palestinian prisoners. I think one of the good fortunes that I had was that I was able to meet, and I have many Palestinian friends who were prisoners, and they kind of introduced me to the whole issue of the Palestinian prisoners. Israel holds thousands and thousands of Palestinians in prison, in its presence. By the way, in, in violation of international law. Not that anybody cares, but this is there. According to Israeli sociologists, and of course some of the Palestinians know very well, the vast majority of all of these thousands of prisoners have never been charged with acts of violence. Only a small percent, I believe 10% or less, have actually been charged with acts of violence. The vast majority of these prisoners, who Israel calls terrorists, of course, have never been charged by Israel, and this is with the very low bar, the very low standard of the Israeli military judicial system, have never been charged with acts of violence. Of course, we have hundreds of prisoners who have never been charged with anything at all. So even with the low bar of the military judicial system in Israel, there was nothing with which they could charge these people. We're talking about hundreds of Palestinians, and they're in jail under administrative detention. I think one was just released after eight years, I believe, without being charged. Now, I think this is also a reflection on the Palestinian resistance. The vast majority of Palestinian resistance has always been unarmed resistance. But of course, the armed resistance, the, the, the violence always gets, gets the news. And all this we can set aside for a moment because the world community, the international community, recognizes the rights of people to resist. The law says that the struggle of people under colonial and alien domination and racist regimes, three things which characterize the state of Israel almost by its own definition, colonial, alien, and racist, so the struggle against this for the implementation of the right to self-determination and independence is legitimate and in full accordance with the uh, principles of international law. People have a right to resist oppression. People have a right to resist racist regimes. If Israel does not like Qassam rockets, Israel can, undo, can lift the siege over Gaza and allow the people in Gaza some freedom. The power to end this is always in the hands of the occupier of the colonizer, of the oppressor, which is always, who is always... I remember my father was once asked, as a, you know, as a former general, how can you talk to terrorists? And he said, well, terrorism is a terrible thing. At the same time, when a smaller nation is oppressed and occupied by larger power, quite frankly, sometimes terrorism is all the, the, only, the only means at their disposal. And again, the vast majority of Palestinian resistance is today, and always has been, unarmed resistance. And one of the first claims, one of the first things that needs to happen is the release of the prisoners. Every, there's not a family in the West Bank, and many of you have been there, I don't think there's a single family in the West Bank where somebody either isn't in jail now or was in jail at one point. They say the Palestinians are one of the most incarcerated people in the world. <coughs> And none of it is for crime. It's all for resistance. Now, again, going back to the, my personal story, in, uh, in September of 1997, my sister's little girl was killed in a suicide attack in Jerusalem. She was 13 years old. And, of course, when things like this happen, it's always big news, but this was bigger news because she, one of the victims was the granddaughter of Mati Peled, who was a general, a very famous general, but also you know, a man who was dedicated to peace. He died two years before that. So the press and everybody, this was huge. And I was living in the U.S. already. I took the first plane home. By the time I arrived in Jerusalem in my sister's apartment, it was full with people, Israelis and Palestinians, who came to express their sorrow, but also full with reporters countless reporters. And the questions are always the same. How do we get them? How do we find them? And how do we punish them? And who is them anyway? Who is responsible? And of course, the Israeli security is always swift, you know, with, with their judgment. When my sister came out after the funeral to talk to people, she said, well, first of all, don't talk to me about revenge and retaliation. She said, no real mother would want to see this happen to any other mother. The idea of killing people in response to somebody's death. 
is despicable and quite frankly crazy, particularly a child. And she quoted from a famous Hebrew poet, Bialik, who wrote that even the devil himself couldn't come up with a vengeance that's appropriate for the death of a child. And in terms of who's responsible, she said, well, who took away Palestinian land and who destroyed their homes, who's just blowing up their homes and who's incarcerating their fathers and brothers and who's shooting young Palestinians in their schools and killing them and who's denying Palestinian water and who's maintaining this horrible oppression and occupation. And both she and her husband said, we hold the Israeli government directly responsible for our daughter's death. Because what do we expect? We expect this will happen right at our doorstep and there will be no consequences? There will be no victims on our side? So of course this became even bigger news because we know that the Palestinians are terrorists and the Israelis are victims. But Israelis want peace and Palestinians, you know, won't compromise. And here is this bereaved Israeli mother turning everything upside down. So this became even bigger news. She became quite an activist, as did her husband, and some of you know him, Rami, and, and their three boys. I went back to the US, and when you carry that small coffin of a child to its final resting place, that's not something you can just brush off and then go to work the next day. So I was determined to do something. I wasn't quite sure what it was. And I was very fortunate that in San Diego, where I live, in California, I found a Jewish-Palestinian discussion group and I decided to attend. And this was the first time I ever met Palestinians. The chapter in the book that talks about this begins with the words, my journey into Palestine began in San Diego. I was 39 years old. I was born and raised in Jerusalem. In Jerusalem. I went to school there, I was born there, I was raised there, I lived you know, many years there. I never met Palestinians because it's a very segregated and racist city. Israelis do not meet Palestinians. I mean, you see Palestinians, of course. And not only that, but this was the first time I ever sat with Palestinians and we were equal. Completely equal. The laws that govern my life in California govern their life. There was no difference. No checkpoints, no curfews, no special laws that uh, differentiated that we get the same water, the same everything. There is no Palestinian in Palestine, Israel, that has any kind of equal rights with Israelis. That doesn't exist. It doesn't exist. There is no Palestinian that enjoys the same rights as Israelis in Israel-Palestine, whether they're citizens or not. So this was a whole new experience for the first time for me. And then I began to learn about the Palestinian story and the Palestinian narrative. And I have to say, in a very kind and kind of gen generous way, they took me through this very painful process of hearing that there's a whole other story, which is the opposite of the story I grew up with and accepting that maybe we can have two stories. And then to the next stage, which is even more difficult and painful, and that's realizing that the story I was raised with was a lie. And it's like taking a, a, a saw or a knife that's not very sharp and just cutting off your arm without anesthesia. Because so much of who I was and who we are as Israelis is derived from that narrative. And if that narrative is not true, what does that mean? And then I began to travel into Palestinian communities, first inside Israel, then in the West Bank, and I, I described this insane fear that I never thought I had. I didn't think I was afraid of Palestinians or Arabs. And suddenly I'm there and Arabs are everywhere. And this insane fear. And the process that I was able to go through, once again, thanks to the generosity of the Palestinian community there and then other Palestinian friends later on, is a very dangerous process where you allow the fear to leave and you allow trust to enter. And the reason it's dangerous is because when the fear leaves and trust enters, there are no more barriers. There are just people. There are no Palestinians, no Israelis, no Jews, no terrorists. They're just people. And we listen to each other and we realize that we are all just people. And that is a very dangerous thing. Because when the barriers come down, how do you justify racist laws? How do you justify the wall? How do you justify this massive army with these big old you know, Rambo types armed to the teeth standing around in front of school children and civilians? And as you know, many of you, when you cross the checkpoints, there's this big Israeli sign that warns Israelis, if you go into the Palestinian controlled areas, you are risking your life and you're committing a felony. 
And there's two or three exclamation marks at the end, in case you didn't think it was serious enough. But every time I cross, and I'm sure many of you have, you cross to the other side, and where's the threat? Where's the danger? Why is this a felony? And every time I cross, I look at that sign, and I look at what happens and what exists after the sign, and I'm, and I'm, 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 I'm baffled. I'm, I'm, I'm appalled by the arrogance, by this arrogance of a country that thinks it can keep people apart just so that they can maintain this oppressive, non-democratic regime, which they just chose to call a Jewish state. And speaking of this Jewish state, you know, the, the last chapter in the book I called One State, Two State, Three States, and it's actually a, a discuss, uh, an argument between myself and my brother-in-law about this issue. You know, where do we go from here? Israel decided to call this a Jewish state. Most Jews don't live there. And most of the people who live there are not Jewish. According to statistics that came out of the Israeli Prime Minister's office, out of 12 million people who live in Palestine, Israel, 5.9 are Israeli Jews. 5.9 million out of 12. So there's no Jewish majority there. Most Jews don't live there. How is it a Jewish state? Because the Zionists decided that this is a Jewish state. And like I said, the most Jews who actually suffered from persecution didn't go there when they could. The reality is that the, the, the options are not one state, two state. This is a myth. It's a diversion. The choice is a single state with exclusive rights for the minority Jewish Israelis or a democracy. Those are the options. Now, many people will say that a Jewish state, the Jewish people deserve to have a state. Fine. If you choose to have a Jewish state in an Arab country where the majority are not Jews, you have to have racist laws that discriminate against the majority. You have to have thousands of political prisoners because there's going to be resistance. You have to have military incursions into civilian areas like Gaza and the West Bank and so on, and the refugee camps in Lebanon and so on. You have to have all this, otherwise you can't maintain it. So if people support the idea of a Jewish state, that's fine, but don't talk to me about human rights. Don't talk about democracy. Don't talk about equal rights. Don't pretend that you're the bad guy, that you're the good guys. You're not. Anybody who supports a Jewish state supports a racist, non-democratic, brutal regime. That's the cost of having a Jewish state, which, by the way, most Jews care very little for. But there is another option. There is another option. The reality where you have one set of laws for people like me, which is a democracy, one set of laws for Palestinians who do have Israeli citizenship, and there are countless of laws that discriminate against them, and like I said, neglect and, and terrible discrimination as a culture, and one set of laws, which is really a military law, that, that Palestinians in the West Bank have to live with. But there is another option. In my lifetime, I'm 52, we've seen racist regimes fall. We've seen, we've seen tyrants fall. We've seen fascism fall. We've seen, I remember Spain was a fascist regime, as was Greece. Not to mention all of Latin America. Not to mention apartheid South Africa, another racist colonialist regime that thought they could maintain uh, the, themselves forever, and they fell. And I think this is probably the closest, although it's not identical, but it's probably the closest comparison. So we've seen this happen in other places. We know what the process is. In fact, I would argue we are already in that process of the struggle against this. Five years ago in America, if you said BDS, nobody knows what you're talking about. BDS is the movement for calling for boycott, divestment, and sanctions against Israel. Five years ago in America, nobody knew what that means. Today, everybody talks about this. The Jewish, the Zionist community is, is worried, sick. They're spending millions of dollars trying to figure out what to do, and they can't do anything. Because more churches and more universities every single day are passing resolutions, divestment resolutions, and boycott resolutions, and accepting either all of parts of the BDS. More and more uh, trade unions and, and banks are pulling away, divesting from Israeli banks and divesting from companies who do business with Israel, here in Europe and in America even. Even in Canada. You know, of course, Canada, I think the prime minister there is, you know, more Bibi Netanyahu than Bibi Netanyahu. 
I mean, even there we see this. And the pro-Palestinian voice on campuses and the pro-Palestinian voice in churches is growing stronger and there is no answer. Not that they're not trying, they're spending millions, but they have no answer. There's no way to, dem to, to show Israel and to legitimize what Israel does. There's no way to do it. People are not stupid. And of course, there's a very determined and principled popular resistance movement in Palestine. I'm sure many of you have been to Bilin and Nabi Saleh and all these other places. I was just there the day they went to this place called Ein Hijla, which is in the Jordan River Valley, and they decided to occupy this old Palestinian city. I went with them that first Friday. It was an amazing sight. Not a single rock, not a single weapon, not a single anything that even looks like a weapon. And within minutes, the Israeli forces show up. You would think World War III is about to start, you know, with their guns and their masks and all this stuff. It took them about a week. Eventually, they came in in full force and, and forced everybody to leave. But it was an, an incredible display of, 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 of uh, first of all, resistance and independence and principled nonviolence. The Palestinian leadership is not just principled and, and dedicated to achieving freedom, but also to doing it without violence, which is very impressive. So all this is taking place. And the purpose has to be the transformation of this racist regime, which is Zionism, into a real democracy. The focus of everybody, every person in this room and beyond, has to be just like the struggle was against uh, racism in South Africa, to end the apartheid regime in South Africa, to end the Zionist regime in Palestine. It is the same thing. There is an equivalency there. Maybe not identical, but there's an equivalency there that's very clear. That is what will make life better for Israelis and for Palestinians. Not only for Palestinians. It will make life better for Israelis. Many of you have been there. You've seen it. It's a beautiful country. There's tremendous potential. You have two societies that are highly educated, highly productive, mostly dem with, with democratic, you know, they've had experience with democratic... Um, government and so forth, they could produce a functioning, productive democracy as long as they have this, the, this one ingredient, which is equal rights. And that is the one we should all be fighting for. Thank you all very much. First of all, I would like to ask you uh, whether you have this kind of lectures in Israel as well. And when uh, you present the, the Israelis, uh, uh, let's say in schools and universities, not in, let's say, in leftists, the way how they're called in Israel, because if you're anti-occupation, you're a leftist in Israel, but with people who are, uh, let's say, um, hesitant or extreme in the opposite side, thinking that the only way for the state of Israel to survive is to um, be Jewish majority, Jewish privileged, and so on and so on. So my question is, because I know quite a lot Israelis and I admire them for uh, being a dissonant voice and being against the dominant narrative, which is always hard. Uh, there it is even harder because of occupation, but also try, for example, defending Rome and the Czech Republic, and you're going to be isolated as well. But <clears throat> what is uh, uh, your hope? Is your hope that people who are outside of Israel are going to change the situation, or you believe that there is uh, indigenous, let's say, transformation within Israeli society, which, in my opinion, would be a much more uh, would be a much more sustainable uh, solution in the long run. And what is your experience when you, for example, say to these uh, people all this information that you gave us? Uh, what, what is, uh, is there a clash between you, or do they have some counter arguments and how to deal with them? Thank you. Is it possible to quantify how many people in Israel share your views? I mean, Israelis. Any other questions? <laughs>
Well, you said many interesting things. Um, I'd like to cite uh, when you said they say it's complicated so that they can leave it alone. Um, for me, one of the most symbolic, let's say, poetic gestures in the whole narrative is that Rabin, who you did criticize, and I would like to know how you consider him a war criminal. I just don't have any facts about that. But he gave a speech in Tel Aviv where he read Sar Shalom, which was the Song of Peace, and there were hundreds of thousands, I believe, in this peace uh, rally. He folded the poem and put it in his breast pocket, and minutes later he was shot. And his own blood soaked to this poem for peace. Yeah. And for me, that image is so strong in terms of how complicated the situation is. And so I love your, your, your idea, the concept that the truth lies in the personal story and not the national narrative. And yet there are so many eclipses of the personal. And yours is one that's very interesting and very important. But if you could speak to that fact that there are so many eclipses of the personal and even the national narrative itself is full of its own eclipses. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, I'll do these three, and if there's any more, we can talk some more. Um, okay, so the first two questions are really the same. Um, the number of people in Israel who, you know, would, would, would accept this um, is probably uh, 10, 100? Imagine South, the whites in South Africa. How many whites in South Africa do you think accepted, willingly wanted, were willing to fight for the end of the apartheid regime? Now, there were some, of course. We know that there were some whites who, who were part of the ANC and, you know, and so on. But uh, as a society, no privileged society ever welcomes or promotes the end of its privilege. That doesn't happen. It didn't happen in South Africa. It didn't happen in the United States with whites in the South. It's not going to happen in Israel either. It's not going to happen. So quantifying is quite, how many people share my views in Israel is quite easy because there are very few. Um, and so a natural consequence of that is that people do not want to have this debate. People in Israel do not want to talk about the end of Zionism. They don't want to discuss a non-Zionist, not to mention an anti-Zionist narrative. Nobody wants to talk about it. Nobody wants to hear it. It is ignored largely. It is largely ignored, which is uh, in many ways going to be their, their Achilles heel, I think, the fact that they ignore it because they pretend like it doesn't exist. Um, so I don't see this coming as a result of the Israeli society one day waking up and seeing the glory of the Lord and, and peace and harmony. That's not how it happens. I do see it, though, happening as a result of pressure from the outside, boycotts, divestments, sanctions, hopefully pressure by, uh, by European and, and other states who will realize that they're supporting the wrong side, uh, that while they fought fascism and racism in their own countries and are supporting it in Palestine, and that's how these things happen. I mean, that is the nature of these, the nature of, of people, that is the nature of these processes. They don't come in necessarily because there's a transformation inside. They come in because there's pressure from the outside, and of course there are always wonderful people on the inside in every society who, who see the injustice and, and, and fight it. And there are many wonderful Israelis who do a fabulous job in solidarity with the Palestinians, refusing to serve in the Israeli military and so forth. Um, and, and of course I have a great deal of respect for them. Um, and sadly, I know most of them, which means there's not that many of them. You know, we don't have to agree whether or not Rabin was a war criminal or not. I mean, it's not that important. I think it is a hist uh, an issue for history to judge, and I know very well about the song of peace and how he was assassinated. 
Um, and while it's all very moving and it's all very wonderful and it seemed all so romantic, uh, none of this has anything to do with peace. Rabin was a war criminal. If you look at his record in 1948, you'll see why. If you look at his record as a general, you'll see why. And if you look at his record as defense minister during the, during the, uh, the, the, the bombing of Beirut, you'll see why. He was a war criminal. He should have been, he should have been sent, as many other, many other Israeli generals and politicians, um, to the International Criminal Court for, for those actions. Um, and none of this was done in hiding, none of this was done in secret, it was all in broad daylight, it was all you know, captured by cameras and so on. Um, I think it's, I, I hear this quite often. Ah, you know, if Rabin was not killed, this would be a different place. If Rabin was not assassinated, we would have peace. It's not true. Rabin signed the Oslo Accords. What is happening today is the success of the Oslo Accords. Oslo Accords did not fail, they succeeded tremendously, spectacularly. What we see today is the result of the success of the Oslo Accords. And Rabin signed them and accepted them because of that. And when Rabin died, nothing changed. And had Rabin been alive on this issue, nothing would have changed. Rabin did not die because he was a man of peace. Rabin died as a result of a clash within Israeli society and his willingness to give the Palestinians a few cities to govern themselves was a part of it. Rabin comes from this elite of, of, of European Jews, Sabras who were generals and fought in 48 and were beautiful and suntanned and, you know, there was this generation of, of who became the political and military elite in Israel. He was killed by someone who came from, who, from by an Arab Jew who was, an orth, who was orthodox and religious. The exact people who Rabin and the people he represented, despised. These were two parts of Israeli society that despised each other. And there was a big clash. And the peace issue, or the so-called peace issue, was one of them. Now, did Rabin uh, capitalize on this uh, Nobel Prize and this whole peace man issue? Of course he did. He was a politician. But I think it was cynical. I don't think it was sincere. Of course, everybody wants peace. Everybody wants love. But what are we, look, look at what he did. And on the Palestinian issue, he did, he did absolutely everything he could so that it would not be, lead to a peaceful resolution. It would not lead to the Palestinian state. And this is why we're in the mess we are today. It was the very agreement that he signed as prime minister that led us to where we are today. It's not, it wasn't a mishap. It wasn't a mistake. It wasn't that something went wrong. Everything went perfectly well for Israel, which was the intention. Uh, but again, we don't have to agree on these particular issues to see the big picture here that is, uh, that, is, that is quite grim, I think, when we start understanding what actually goes on in Israel and what Zionism is all about and how the very nature of Zionism is in contradiction to compromise and peace on the issue of the land. Okay? What do you think about the influence of the religion of the Bible? Oh. Oh. The influence of religion? Oh. I mean, for instance, verses as every place whereon the soles of your feet shall tread shall be yours. I'm sorry, can you repeat that? Beg pardon? Can you say that again? Every place whereon the soles of your feet shall tread shall be yours. It's from Deuteronomy 11, 24. And similar is at the beginning of Joshua. I am afraid that uh, almost all Christians believe that these are the words of God and uh, religion is very difficult to reform. I'm uh, just interested in kind of going over kind of the term Semite and understanding more or less how utilizing this term sorry, has more or less like synonymous with anti, you know, like anti-Semitism and kind of understanding more or less that what I've read and from what I've understood too, that Semi also has, you know, Christian Muslim connotations as well. So it'd kind of be interesting if you could kind of maybe elaborate a bit more about kind of okay. I try to make my, my question easy and short. Uh, you, as the way I get it, you present it as kind of a vision how the relations, uh, the relations between Israel and Palestine should proceed. And uh, what do you think should be uh, from now on, the practical moves uh, sh that should be done, the practical moves that uh, the international community should do, 
and uh, the practical moves the Israel elite should do. And one more added to this, do you think that uh, it, uh, the, the main force who, who leads the process to the way how you see it uh, uh, desirable should be elites or the masses of the Israeli society or some, somehow equally? Thank you. Okay, good questions. Um, look, the influence of religion, I mean, it can't be ignored, but at the same time, I don't think this is, a, this is not a religious conflict. Um, and I'll tell you why. Uh, like I said earlier, I, I don't think the Bible is a history book. It's a book of faith. Some people believe it, some people don't believe it. And that's how it's going to be. The Israeli-Palestinian conflict is a political conflict. It's, the Israeli-Palestinian issue is an issue of, a, of, of colonizing, it's an issue of a racist regime, it's an issue of discrimination, it's an issue of oppression, and it's an issue that has to be resolved as a result of a struggle for freedom and democracy. None of this has anything to do with religion. Is religion involved in Palestine? Of course. It's a place that all, that's why we're talking about this tiny little speck of a country instead of talking about problems in Chad or Niger or, 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 or Congo, you know, far bigger countries. But here we are. Um, the two, the two main religions, which are Jews and, 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 and Muslims in Palestine, historically have lived in peace. Historically and even theologically, they're, they're, sisters, they're sister religions. In America, they talk about this, this idea of Judeo-Christian values. I think it's a myth. I think if any values are shared, or more so shared, are certainly between Islam and, and, and Judaism, far more than, than Judaism and, and Christianity. Although I think all shared values are good and all religions have, have something to offer. So um, I, I don't think this is, this is, this is religion has, uh, should be allowed to enter into this issue uh, because, like I said, it's not an issue of religion. I will also say this in terms of the churches. Many churches, and now, again, I'm speaking about America, you see more and more churches who are unwilling to accept that this or that happened to be the word, word of God, and even if it is, that it means today Israel has a right to oppress Palestinians and that uh, we, uh, has a right to maintain this colonial regime in Palestine. In fact, like I said earlier, more and more churches are, instead of going to Palestine and to Israel to see the holy sites, they go there to support the Palestinians. They go there to volunteer as, uh, and to escort Palestinian children so that the settlers and the army won't harass them, or, or farmers and so on. So you see more and more churches who are taking on that role, and then, like I said, passing resolutions of divestment, passing resolutions of boycott, and accepting all or parts of the BDS. Um, and I think this is a very positive thing. Obviously, not everyone. Of course, there are always going to be fanatics who see it one way or the other, and that's just the way it is. But I think the more people work together, the more people see that there is hope, the more people see that there is a... Actually, from a religious perspective, there's, there's, the, there's a history of good relations and moderation, certainly in the Middle East, between Jews and Muslims, then the, this diminishes the power of the fanatics. You know, the more we allow for normalcy, the less power the fanatics on the ends uh, have. So I think it's important to bring that to light, and I think it's important to bring to light the, the churches and the religious organizations who do see uh, what is going on and are willing to participate in the struggle for freedom and democracy for Palestinians and for Israelis. Um, the issue, I, I'm going to assume, I'm assuming that you want to talk about anti-Semitism, not just explaining Semitism. Um, and I think the anti-Semitism uh, claim is a very interesting one. Because, and I'm sure you hear this uh, quite often uh, here and other places in Central Europe. So the claim is, and this comes straight down from the Israeli Prime Minister's office. If you criticize Israel, not to mention if you reject Zionism, then you must be anti-Semitic. So anti-Semitism means you're a racist, it means you hate Jews, it means perhaps you're a Nazi, that sort of thing. Which is a very interesting claim. But let's take it a step further. So what does it mean when you support the State of Israel? Because when you support the State of Israel, you're supporting a state that has laws that discriminate against the non-Jewish population. You're supporting a state that gives Palestinians about one-tenth of the water that Israelis get. You are supporting a state that has thousands of political prisoners who are Palestinians. 
You're supporting a state that on a regular basis for nearly seven decades have been attacking and killing civilians, Palestinian civilians, in Palestine and later on in refugee camps in southern Lebanon and so on. So if opposing that is anti-Semitism, what is it called when you support this monstrosity? Are you enlightened? Are you a Jew lover? I mean, what does it mean? Are you some kind, I mean, how does it even make sense to say that criticizing this monstrosity, this brutal regime, is racist and anti-Semitic? Never mind the fact that you have Jewish people on almost every pro-Palestinian organization that I know has Jewish people who participate and support the Palestinians on campuses and peace justice groups and so on. Of course, they don't stand up with a big sign that say, I'm Jewish. They say, I'm a human being and I support justice in Palestine as well as other places. You know, so it is such an absurd claim. It is such a stupid claim. And it demonstrates one thing, one very important thing. They have nothing to say. The biggest problem Israel has is an issue of legitimacy, not security. Palestinians have never posed a security threat. Certainly today, Hamas in Gaza does not pose a security threat to Israel. They have no ability to, to answer to Israel's massive arms and, and big army. But Gaza, other refugee camps, the Palestinian cause, are a threat to the legitimacy of Israel, which is why they have to pull out the Holocaust and the anti-Semitism and the terrorism and the Islamophobiaism and every ism you want that can just possibly scare people. Because there is no way to legitimize Israel and no way to legitimize what Israel does. And I see this all the time. They're spending millions in America to combat BDS. They're spending millions to, to bring groups into the campuses and argue with the pro-Palestinians. And they come up with nothing. They come up with anti-Semitism. That's all they have. That's all they have. So I would say the response to that is that it is nonsense. And now please explain what do you call somebody who supports this regime? Is there a name for that? Because if there is, I'd like to know. Um, the practical question is an excellent question. Somebody asked me today, what would I say to you know, the, the Czech president or something? You know, what should what she do tomorrow morning? Um, well, what I would say is this. First of all, bring back your ambassador from Tel Aviv. Send home the Israeli ambassador and cut all, stop all relations until all the Palestinian prisoners are freed and the Gaza and the, and the siege on Gaza is lifted and there's a date for free and fair elections with one person, one vote. Until then, there should be no connections with Israel until these things are, 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 uh, take place. And I think that all, every Western country and every country that respects uh, human rights needs to do this. These things should, there's nothing, there should not be arguable. There's nothing to argue or negotiate. These are things that have to take place first thing. I suspect that the Czech government's not going to do this. Um, although I was hoping that my presence here would, you know, maybe encourage them to change their foreign policy. But I don't think, I don't, maybe that's, maybe that was overly optimistic. Um, in terms of how this is going to happen, this is going to happen as a result of, you know, the masses, it's going to happen as a result of grassroots, it's going to happen from the bottom up. And again, we can compare what happened in South Africa and, 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 and learn from that. Like I said, we're not inventing the wheel, this has happened before. Um, and I think the thing to do is to realize that this issue is, de is going to define our time. You know, the 60s were defined by the Vietnam War and American crimes in Southeast Asia and the Civil Rights Movement. The 80s were defined by the struggle against apartheid in South Africa. We, this era, we are all going to be def is defined and we are all going to be judged on how we stood on Palestine. Our kids, our grandkids are going to say, where did you stand? And all the politicians and the prime ministers and uh, uh, out there in the West today that support Israel, I would wager that they would either deny they supported Israel or hide under a chair because they will have nothing to say. And I think this is going to happen much sooner than people think. So I would say rally behind the banner of freedom and equality in Palestine. Rally behind the Palestinian cause. Expose Israeli crimes. Don't be afraid to equate Zionism with racism and apartheid because that's what it is. 
and make sure that you, and by you I mean every single person here, does something to this issue because we're all going to be judged by it, we're all going to be defined by it, and in the end it'd be nice to say to our kid children, you know what, this is where we stood, this is where I stood, as opposed to the people who support Israel who will have nothing to say and like I said, will probably deny, just like the people who supported apartheid in Europe and in America, deny that they ever did that as well. I think that's going to be the process. So study the issue and find a way in which you can participate, whether it's BDS, whether it's protests, whether it's ISM. I mean, there's lots of different things out there that you can participate and support this cause. All right, last three. And I appreciate highly you encourage us as a party for the audience the, the atrocities of the Israeli occupation against the Palestinians. But I simply ask, I could understand that you consider the two-state solution almost as a means now, because the possibilities are reducing. So the other possibility is either by national state or democratic state. Do you think if there will be a poll now in Israel, how many will accept this solution? this uh, solution. That is one. Secondly, regarding this process of boycotting Israel, I mean on the world scale, it is focused not on the uh, to press Israel for a, a, a democratic state or, or a binational, but the aim is or in favor of the two separate uh, being independent states. It doesn't mean, of course, that there is no possibility historically for the both either binational or democratic. But first of all, I, I guess, first of all, that the Palestinians should exercise their right for self-determination as to have something when starting, uh, I mean, to establish such a uh, solution. Because it, the, the, the bi-national state or the democratic state, it is done like marriage. Both sides have to, to, to I mean, uh, participate in it. Still, I don't know. Don't you think now, uh, although I respect your opinion, that now to, to give up the uh, to, to the independent state and, and to, to focus on the uh, binational or democratic could divert the intention of the public opinion, the international public opinion, on the specific solution which could, could be implemented. Thank you. Uh, good evening. I would like to thank you to you and to the organizers for the realization of such a really interesting and impressive uh, meeting. Mainly because in the Czech Republic uh, we usually hear one side information, especially in official media. My question is, uh, you live in the uh, United States. Uh, how you are accepted there because um, in my opinion uh, there is very strong pro-Israel uh, lobby. Thank you. I just want to ask or ask you to just wait for the audience, not for me. The history of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, it is not, it didn't start at 37. It was all the end, no Holocaust in, in, in 1897 in Basel. It was already decided for the Jewish state in Palestine, not in 47. This is one thing. The other thing, after that, when the, the solution, in, uh, after the second, first, second world, it was also decided for the, the Jewish or for the Palestinian to be a homeland for, Palestine, for Jew, 
Jewish people all over the world by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Britain and came the mandate. Belfort came with the, his with his decision or his uh, I don't know I, to give the land which doesn't belong to him for people who are not there and it was gave, came the mandate in 19, 1917 up to the 1947 even a will withdraw the British before or in the day of the declaration and all the time if a Palestinian had a very small weapon it was hanged but the Jewish the, the Jewish people I don't mean I don't have anything against the Jewish I we have good relations with them that time but there, it was the, 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 politici the politics of the British to give for the Jewish everything in Palestine, even the arms. They gave them everything. They were for, and what, for that was what they call it the victory for the independence of Israel. And just very, just last thing I want to say, Israel was accepted in the United Nations with a condition to accept the, the right of return for the Palestinians. This was one main, main solution, main, main uh, reason that was accepted as a member in the United Nations. Thank you. Thank you. Well, <clears throat> these are all tough questions, but they have to be discussed, so thank you for that. Um, The question of the, the um, is it still realistic to expect that Israel will allow a Palestinian state in the West Bank? I don't think so. I don't think anybody thinks so. I don't think anybody has a realistic expectation that there could be an agreement with the state of Israel that would allow the Palestinians a state in the West Bank and Gaza. Such an Israeli uh, a government, an Israeli government that would allow that is, is in our imagination maybe. There is no such animal, there is no such creature, there is no such thing alive today and I, I suspect there never will be. Just look at how even now Israeli cabinet members are mocking Kerry. They call him names. They call him uh, deranged messianic. They, they poke fun at him. And they say they can negotiate all day long. These are Israeli cabinet members saying, they can negotiate all day long. We are never going to allow the Palestinians a state. This is Zionism. I think the problem here is not the viability of, of the creation of a Palestinian state. The problem is understanding that Zionism is incompatible with peace and compromise, which is why we ended up not having a Palestinian state, even though the last, you know, there were opportunities in the beginning to bring about a peace based on a two-state solution, and Israel chose not to do this. And they succeeded. I think they succeeded. Uh, do Palestinians have a right to self-determination? I think that's undoubtedly the answer is yes. Is it realistic to expect that there will be a Palestinian state? I think the answer to that is no. Besides which, I think you'll agree with me that a small, you cannot reduce Palestine to the West Bank. There's more than Palestine. Yaffa is Palestine. The Nakab Desert is Palestine. They just tried to kick out tens of thousands of, of, of Palestinian Bedouins from the Nakab Desert. I was there at the protests last summer. Everybody was carrying a Palestinian flag and wearing the whole map of Palestine. You know, 25, 30 years ago, those very people called themselves Israeli Arabs. There's no such thing anymore. Palestinians are in the Negev, the Pal in Nakab Desert, they're in Jerusalem, they're in the Muthalath, they're in the Galilee, they're everywhere, including the West Bank and Gaza. So you can't really reduce Palestine, and I, I don't think I need to tell you this, of course, uh, that you cannot reduce the Palestinian issue to the West Bank and Gaza, even if it was feasible, uh, but I don't think it's feasible. It's not a question if Palestinians deserve it or if this would be the preferred solution. We have a reality that we have to live with we're faced with a reality that was, that was, that, 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 uh, was created by Israel. And that's just the way it is right now. So now I would say the realistic approach would say, okay, what is the next best idea? 
which solution will serve the people who live there best. And then, these are the options. What we have today is one option, and the transformation to democracy is another option. And I think it's, a, it's, it's, it's time to make that very clear, that these are the choices. And yes, it means the end of the Jewish state. And yes, it means that we, we have to fight Zionism. And even here in Europe, with all the history and the Holocaust, we need to say these things. And of course, like you mentioned, the two things are not really connected, but they're presented that way. Um, Israelis will not accept this willingly. Like I said, no uh, society that is, uh, has ever accepted to relinquish its privileges. Israel will not do this willingly. But as a result of the pressure, as a result of the boycott, as a result of all of this, there will be an Israeli prime minister who, like the clerk in South Africa, stood up one day and he, he said, Nelson Mandela will be released unconditionally. And everybody knew what that meant. It meant apartheid was on its way out. And I think there will be an Israeli prime minister who will say the prisoners will be released unconditionally and free and fair elections, one person, one vote, will proceed to take place in the next, you know, so many months. This is the process that has to take place. It's the only process that offers any kind of justice to the Palestinians, at the end of which, of course, the right of return will have to be discussed and other issues. Um, the next question on, on the issue, how I'm, I'm accepted quite well in the United States. I mean, uh, people invite me all the time to speak. Um, the Israeli lobby doesn't, and the Zionist community, of course, don't. But, you know, I think there's this misrepresentation mis uh, of the reality. Um, the Zionist community likes to pretend that they are the Jewish community. There is no such thing as a Jewish community, certainly not in America. You've got, I don't know, a hundred different little communities, and they're all Jewish. You've got Orthodox, you've got within the Orthodox community, you've got whole different communities, some are Zionist, some are anti-Zionist. You've got religious people, you've got secular people, you've got reformed people. The vast majority don't really care about Israel. A small group does. And within that group, some oppose Israel and reject it, and some are Zionists. So there's no such thing as a, a Jewish community. There's a Zionist community that has a loud voice, and they pretend that they represent everyone, which they don't. Um, and it has a, Israel, of course, has a very strong lobby, as we all know. Um, like I said, almost every pro-Palestinian event that I go to or that I'm invited to speak, there is a strong Jewish presence. They don't stand up there with a big sign, but, you know, we talk and we know, you know, the so-and-so might be Jewish, so-and-so Jewish. You know, on college campuses, everywhere, this is true. Um, and, um, and like I said, the, the voice, the Palestinian voice is getting stronger in America. I think the Israeli lobby is getting weaker. They're spending millions of dollars trying to combat this. They're losing, it's a losing battle. Um, and again, I think, I think this, is, this, is, this, is, this, is all, this is all good, and it's a result of the excellent work that's done by, very, you know, by young people everywhere in the U.S. and in Palestine and other places. Um, and as for the last question, you're absolutely right. The conflict didn't begin uh, in 1947. I, I just like to bring that as a point from which the two narratives uh, begin. This whole idea, you hear many pro-Israelis say, yes, but the Balfour Declaration, they promised, uh, you know, Balfour you know, Declaration, they promised the homeland for the Jews. Who is Balfour to promise anything to anybody in Palestine? Why are we accepting this as though this is, you know, the Ten Commandments? Who is he? Who is the United Nations to partition Palestine? You know, these are things that we accept. It's like, I think I have a debate in the, either tomorrow or the next day with someone from the Jewish community. But see how absurd this is. I am an Israeli. My parents were colonizers and, and settlers and oppressors. He, I suspect, is a Czech Jew who has no reason to claim Palestine at all. And here we are going to be discussing his country the future of his country. And this is accepted, you know, the, the white Europeans are discussing Palestine. And we see this everywhere. Who are we as settlers and, 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 and Jews who, you know, happen to be Jews and, you know, might, might be Czech, they might be Polish, they might be American. Who are we to, and this happens in Israel too, in the left, in the kind of very progressive circles, everybody's discussing this, and then where's the, where are the Palestinians? You never see a Palestinian as though they were, you know, we just don't know where they are, we can't find one. How do you find a Palestinian, you know? 
This is the reality. It's this absurd reality. And I think it goes back to the same idea of the Balfour, Balfour thinking he can give a country to somebody, and the UN think that they can slice up a country for somebody. It's this very Orientalist, colonialist mentality that is still with us today, here in Central Europe. You know, and we accept this, this, this absurdity. Um, and so I agree with you. The, 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 the history of the relations was good. The Zionists came, armed themselves, and created this mess with the support of the British. And I would recommend, I'll just say one last word, on this issue and what, what this, the, 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 the gentleman in the last question mentioned, if you want an absolute wonderful narrative of this uh, development, I strongly recommend that you read a book by Ibrahim Nasrallah uh, called The Time of White Horses. Ibrahim Nasrallah is a Palestinian writer. He's probably one of the most important writers in the Arab world today. And it was translated into English. It's a saga. It's like this thick, you know. But I've never read a book so fast in my life. And it describes exactly how this came about through a novel. It's a novel. It's a saga of one village in Palestine. The Time of White Horses. I strongly recommend it. Um, because it, is, uh, it demonstrates exactly these early times and, and, and how things transpired. And he wrote much of it after talking to people and, you know, through personal narratives and narratives of towns and villages and so on, people who had already passed away, and he created this novel, so I strongly recommend it. Anyway, once again, thank you all very much. <laughs>